So far we've learned about network models, protocol layering, and LAN technologies, specifically Ethernet technology. And in the last section, we learned about IP addressing, subnet masking, and routing IP packets through an Ethernet-based LAN. Now in this section, we'll discuss how these companies interconnect their geographically dispersed LANs using different Wide Area Network, or WAN, technologies. One key difference between a LAN and a WAN is that LANs are built, owned, and operated by individual companies and organizations. But unlike LANs, WANs are owned by third-party service providers. A company wanting to connect its geographically dispersed LANs must subscribe to a WAN service provider, such as a telephone company, to use or lease its WAN carrier network services. WAN service providers are also called service providers, telcos, WAN carriers, or just plain carriers. A company then uses the data links provided by these service providers to connect remote locations to each other or to access the Internet. Like Ethernet LANs, traditional WAN protocols operate at the physical and data link layers, or layers 1 and 2. Each WAN technology, such as the point-to-point -point protocol, or PPP, or Frame Relay, uses a different Layer 2 frame format and provides different options for reliability and error recovery. In this section, we'll also cover Multi-Protocol Label Switching, or MPLS, which isn't a WAN technology, but a WAN service offered by service providers. MPLS operates between Layer 2 and Layer 3, and some refer to MPLS as a Layer 2.5 protocol. Just as different Ethernet network devices, such as hubs, bridges, and switches, emerged to address specific network growth issues, WAN technologies also went through a similar evolution process. To explain these different WAN technologies, we'll revisit Acme Company and see how its growth required each different technology. If you've ever looked at a network diagram, you've probably seen a network cloud. This cloud typically represents the WAN, or the Internet, through which data travels to get from one LAN to another. A cloud is used to represent the WAN or Internet precisely because it's nebulous and hides the details of the service provider's network links and switching equipment. As a customer, you don't really need to know the exact path data takes through the provider's network to reach its final destination. In other words, data leaves one site, enters the cloud, and then somehow reaches the other. The path over which the data travels within the network cloud is the service provider's responsibility. But to understand WANs, you still need to be familiar with what happens within the cloud. Consider the network diagram shown on screen. In earlier sections, we discussed the LAN connectivity, the IP addressing scheme in use, and how data flowed between different LANs. We won't focus on the detail of LANs anymore in this section, so we'll simplify our graphic. When we last saw them, Acme was getting the network at its manufacturing facility up and running. Of course, once the LAN at the new facility was working, Acme wanted to connect it to the LAN at its corporate headquarters. To accomplish this goal, the company installed a WAN link to interconnect the LANs at each location. Before we delve into the details of Acme Company's WAN, let's first discuss some of the equipment and terminology used in a WAN environment. Earlier we saw that Acme installed a router to interconnect the different broadcast domains. Now the same router will interconnect Acme's geographically separated LANs. But to make this connection, Acme will also need to install additional equipment to connect its router to the service provider's network. Customer Premises Equipment, or CPE, is any communications equipment located on the customer's premises that is used to connect to the service provider's network. The customer can own the CPE or can lease it from the service provider. Acme uses its CPE to connect to the service provider's nearest exchange, or central office, often called a CO. A copper or fiber cable connects the CPE to the nearest CO. This cabling is often called the local loop, or last mile. The device generating the data is known as Data Terminal Equipment, or DTE. In this case, the DTE is Acme's routers. The device that actually puts the data on the local loop is called Data Communications Equipment, or DCE. The DCE, such as a modem, ensures that the data is in the correct format for the local loop. Let's see what these components look like in a different context. A PC is another example of DTE that might also use a modem, the DCE, to access the local loop. 
The local loop can either be an analog line, like the voice grade phone line coming into your home, or a digital line like the ones used by companies. Earlier we learned that computers generate digital signals, specifically ones and zeros. The analog phone line, however, typically carries voice traffic, which is a continuous series of electrical pulses that vary over time, like waves. A digital signal is like a light switch. It is either on or off. An analog signal is like a dimmer switch, which can vary. As you probably know from your home computer, to send computer data over an analog phone line, you need a modem. A modem converts or modulates the digital signal into a format for the analog phone line. At the other end, a modem converts or demodulates the analog signal into the digital signal a computer understands. Analog phone lines are typically copper. Routers also generate digital signals, but they usually connect to a digital line, so a modem isn't usually necessary. Instead, a router can use a CSU-DSU to connect to a digital line. CSU-DSU stands for Channel Service Unit and Digital Service Unit. For more information on CSU-DSUs, click the link on screen, or click the Continue button to continue with this topic. A device called a CSU-DSU is required to prepare data traffic for digital lines. Network equipment manufacturers make CSUs and DSUs as separate physical devices or combined in a single physical device. Some manufacturers build the CSU-DSU into the WAN card inserted in the router. The CSU provides termination for the digital signal and ensures connection integrity through error correction and line monitoring. The DSU converts the digital frames used in the service provider's network into a frame format that the router can understand and vice versa. Digital lines can either be copper or fiber. In fact, it is not the type of connection, copper or fiber, that dictates the type of line. Rather, it is the equipment being used on the line that dictates whether the line is analog or digital. After the data leaves the customer's location, it arrives at the service provider's central office. A CO is like a distribution center, sending data to other COs along the path to its final destination. Within any large city, a service provider might have several COs interconnected using high-speed fiber optic trunk lines. Some COs might connect to other service providers, such as international carriers. Within a central office, you'll find the different kind of switches that make this communication possible, some of which we'll cover later in this section. For now, the switches take the customer's data and send it to the correct location. Now that you know some of the terminology and concepts of WAN technology, let's take a look at the specific technologies used by WANs at Layer 1, the physical layer. Most people remember the days when traditional phone lines were used for both voice and data communication. Some of you might still use dial-up. In the old days, computers used modems to transmit digital data over these analog copper phone lines, and the fastest data transfer rate was only 30 kilobits per second. In this section, we're going to learn how WANs first went from using analog to digital phone lines, and then ultimately to fiber optic connections, providing ever-increasing bandwidth at the physical layer. You've probably heard the terms T1 and T3, or E1 and E3, in connection with WANs. Perhaps you have also heard of SONNET, or SDH. Let's take a look at what these terms mean, starting with T1. Unlike an analog or plain old telephone service line, which is referred to as a POTS line, a T1 line is a high-speed digital telephone line that transfers data at 1.54 megabits per second. You might remember from the earlier section on bandwidth that 1.54 megabits per second isn't very fast by today's standards. But back when they were developed, they were lightning fast. T1 lines are dedicated connections between two points, as you see here, so they're also referred to as point-to-point -point connections. T1 lines are used to transmit voice and data between devices in North America and Japan. The T in T1 comes from the term T carrier system, a series of digital data transmission formats originally developed by the Bell system in the 1960s 
as a way to reduce the number of telephone cables in large cities. Originally designed for voice traffic, this system combines or multiplexes voice and data signals from different devices within a location into a single link using Time Division Multiplexing, or TDM. With TDM, devices take turns transmitting a fixed amount of data across the link using a specific time slot or channel. A T1 line divides a single line into 24 different channels. You can think of a T1 line as a type of telephone service capable of transporting the equivalent of 24 conventional telephone lines over two pairs of wires. Instead of having individual phone lines for digital phones, fax machines, and computers, companies can use TDM and send all signals across a single T1 line. So how do you have 24 conversations occurring at the same time? To help explain this concept, let's look at a very simple TDM example. Here we have three devices wanting to share a single communications link. Each device is assigned a time slot from 1 to 3. Each device gets a turn to send data, and data from all three devices is placed into a single frame, so the data from each device is contained within its own time slot in each frame. The frame is sent, and then the process is repeated. If a device doesn't have any data to send, the time slot is left empty. Once transmitted, the data in each frame is sent to the corresponding time slot on the other end of the communications link. So a T1 line consists of 24 channels, also known as time slots, or DS zeros, each operating at 64 kilobits per second. Each conversation, whether voice or data, is assigned to a specific time slot. Each time slot gets a turn to talk or transmit, 8 bits at a time. Once all 24 time slots have had a turn, a bit is stuffed in for framing and synchronization, and the process is repeated 8,000 times a second. So if we do the math, we'll see that 24 time slots times 8 bits equals 192 bits. Add the extra bit we just mentioned, and you get 193 bits, which constitutes a single T1 frame. If this process happens 8,000 times per second, then 193 multiplied by 8,000 times per second equals 1.54 megabits per second. As we just mentioned, a T1 line provides a customer with a dedicated connection from one location through the WAN carrier's network to a second location. Customers have a choice of allocating all of the time slots for data, or they can allocate all the time slots for voice, or they can allocate time slots for any combination of voice and data. Each of the time slots in the examples we've been looking at can also be referred to as a DS0. DS0 is the basic digital signaling rate. DS stands for digital signal and is a system of classifying digital circuits according to the rate and format of the signal. A DS0 offers 64 kilobits per second of bandwidth, the amount of bandwidth usually used for one telephone voice channel. A DS1 circuit is made up of 24 DS zeros. You'll often hear people use the terms T1 and DS1 interchangeably, but technically speaking, they're not the same. The term DS1 refers to the digital signal service provided over the wire. A DS1 signal offers 1.54 megabits per second of bandwidth and has a specific format. It might be transported over a T1 line or another type of line. The term T1 refers to the physical line, which is copper wire, carrying a DS1 signal. If a DS1 circuit is transported over another type of material, such as fiber, it is no longer a T1. In addition to a T1 line, you might also have heard of a T3 line, which is also known as a DS3. As we saw earlier with T1 lines, T3s are also built on the base DS0 signal. A T3 is 28 DS1s, or 672 DS0s, bundled together. Many people use the terms T3 and DS3 interchangeably as well. Like DS1s and T1s, a DS3 is the electrical signal carried on a T3 line, which is also copper-based, running at 44.74 megabits per second, including some overhead bits to provide bit stuffing, alignment, error checking, and in-band management. Years ago, when digital communication lines were very expensive, 
a company might not need 1.54 megabits per second between each location. Instead, a company might only need 384 kilobits per second, or 6 DS zeros to one location, and 768 kilobits per second, or 12 DS zeros to a second location, and purchase a fractional T1 service. In the example shown on screen, Acme Company has a 384 kilobits per second connection to Site A and a 768 kilobits per second connection to Site B. The provider can offer the remaining 384K to other customers. Most companies now use the entire T1 line for data. For more bandwidth, service providers bundle T1 lines together and offer a bonded T1 service. Many businesses use T1s to connect to other locations or the Internet. In most other places in the world, customers use E1 services, where the E stands for European, in place of T carrier services. T1 and E1 services are incompatible, though both use the DS0 as the base signal rate. An E1 differs slightly from a T1 in that its data rate is 2.05 megabits per second and is comprised of 32 DS zeros instead of 24. Earlier we saw that a DS3 bundles 28 DS ones. Here we see that an E3 bundles 16 E ones or 512 DS zeros, and has a data rate of 34.37 megabits per second. Today, even these faster speeds are not fast enough for most WAN service providers and even some of their customers. Ten years ago, home Internet users did not have access to Internet speeds anywhere near the 1.5 megabit per second speed of a T1. But these days, many home users have download speeds of 20 megabits per second or more. This might make T1s seem a bit antiquated, and indeed, the percentage of companies using T1 lines is declining. A 2013 survey by Infonetics Research found that 71% of companies surveyed in North America use T1 lines. Why do they still use T1s? As we just saw, T1s can carry data and voice circuits on the same copper cable in different channels. Dedicated lines help maintain data privacy within companies. They offer the same upload speed as download speed, unlike some other technologies. The speed is actually adequate for many offices that do not have extensive broadband needs. The Infinetic survey also found that only 55% of the companies surveyed still plan to be using T1 lines in 2015. A big reason for this is the shift to voice over IP, which means that those old voice lines are no longer needed. To build WANs fast enough to constitute the cloud you see in most network diagrams, T1s and T3s are not sufficient. Carriers have moved from copper cables to fiber optics, and different standards have developed for fiber optics. Copper cables are impacted by interference from other cables, and signals sent over copper cables degrade over long distances. Both of these conditions negatively impact throughput for copper. You can boost the signal on a copper cable to take it farther, but doing so takes time, decreasing your speed. If you were taking a long-distance trip in a car, you wouldn't want to have to stop in every town you passed and refuel. Fiber cables, which are made of glass, can go well beyond the distance limitations of copper with clear, strong signals. You can go much faster without interference. And because fiber allows signals to travel long distances without degradation, you don't have to stop to boost your signal as often either. Just as with T1 and T3 lines used in North America and E1 and E3 lines used in Europe, similar standards were developed for fiber optics lines. Synchronous Optical Network, or SONNET, was developed first and deployed in North America. Synchronous Digital Hierarchy, or SDH, was developed later and, like E1 and E3 lines, were deployed in the rest of the world. The SONNET and SDH standards define a basic frame format and a hierarchy of signaling speeds. The two standards are not compatible, each using different frame formats and different base signaling levels. But to keep costs down, most SONNET SDH hardware can be configured by way of software to support either standard. To find out more about the SONNET and SDH standards, click the link on screen or click the Continue button to move on.
Since sonnet and SDH standards are quite complex, we'll focus on basic terminology and concepts. The frame format used by sonnet is the synchronous transport signal, or STS. The signaling measurements for fiber optics develop similarly to that of the DS levels we saw earlier. In the sonnet standard, the lowest or base level signal is the synchronous transport signal level 1, or STS-1. An STS-1 operates at 51.84 megabits per second, which is enough to carry an entire DS-3 link. STS-1 links are rarely deployed individually. Instead, three STS-1s are either multiplexed together, like DS-0s in a T1, or they are bundled or concatenated together. When three STS-1 links are multiplexed, they are referred to as a channelized STS-3 link, where each STS-1 link is treated as a separate channel. When three STS-1 links are concatenated and viewed as a single big pipe, it is referred to as an unchannelized STS-3C link, where the C means concatenated. The table on screen shows the different STS signals, their associated bit rate, and capacity. You probably hear the terms OC3 or OC12 more than STS3 or STS12. Sometimes they are used interchangeably, but there is a difference. The term OC stands for optical carrier. The term refers to a sonnet signal being carried over a fiber optic network. The OC level expresses the speed of an OC N line, where the speed is equal to N times 51.84 megabits per second. An OC1 signal has a bit rate of 51.84 megabits per second. An OC3 signal has a bit rate of 51.84 times 3 megabits per second, or 155.52 megabits per second. A synchronous transport signal, or STS, is not necessarily carried on a fiber optic line. STS can be used generically to refer to the sonnet frame format, or it can be used to refer to sonnet signals being carried electronically using coaxial cabling instead of fiber. Similar to sonnet standards used in North America, the SDH standard used in the rest of the world uses the Synchronous Transport Module, or STM frame format. The SDH hierarchy has STM1 as the base level signal at 155.52 megabits per second. An STM1 is equivalent to an STS3C, or OC3, in terms of speed. SDH, like Sonnet, has a hierarchy of signaling speeds. Multiple lower-level signals can be combined or multiplexed together to form higher-level signals. For example, four STM1 signals multiplexed together form an STM4 signal. Optical Transport Network, or OTN, is widely considered a successor to traditional SONNET and SDH networks for transport of data over optical networks. OTN is based on Wavelength Division Multiplexing, or WDM. SONNET and SDH both use Time Division Multiplexing, the same type of multiplexing used by T1 and E1 lines, but, in this case, used over fiber optic lines. Time Division Multiplexing transmits multiple data streams over a single line by putting each byte of data into a different time slot. Wavelength division multiplexing transmits incoming signals simultaneously over a fiber optic line by putting each signal into a different wavelength or color of light. On the receiving end, the demultiplexer recognizes each different wavelength of light and turns it back into the signal it received. So why is this better than time division multiplexing? OTN can transport many more signals over a fiber optic line at the same time. The OTN systems that are rapidly replacing Sonnet SDH systems today can operate on 40 or even 80 channels simultaneously. In addition, OTN can easily integrate with existing systems. Incoming signals can be Sonnet, SDH, Ethernet, or native OTN traffic. Like Sonnet, OTN also provides performance monitoring and fault handling, resulting in high reliability. Now that we've covered WAN Layer 1 technologies, let's move up the stack and take a look at what specific technologies are used by WANs at Layer 2. Remember that when we looked at Ethernet technologies, we saw how routers and switches use Layer 3 and Layer 2 or MAC addresses to get the data to its final destination. When data is going over a WAN, 
Different Layer 2 technologies are used, but the basic concept is the same. A router first uses the Layer 3 address to determine the next hop along the way to the destination network. The next hop router strips that frame, performs a route lookup, and adds a new Layer 2 frame suitable for the receiving LAN. The Point-to-Point -point Protocol, or PPP, Frame Relay, ATM, and Carrier Ethernet are all examples of Layer 2 WAN technologies. We'll start our look at Layer 2 by learning more about PPP. Let's return to Acme Company. At its new manufacturing location, it created five separate networks or broadcast domains and interconnected them using a router. To connect this location to the corporate network located at headquarters hundreds of kilometers away, Acme needed a permanent, dedicated connection and decided to lease a T1 line from its WAN service provider. This lease line, also known as a point-to-point -point link, provides a pre-established communications path between the two locations with a fixed amount of bandwidth, whether or not it is used. That solution resolved the Layer 1 or physical layer issues. But, like Ethernet LANs, WANs operate at both the physical and data link layers, or Layers 1 and 2. So let's go up a layer and see what happens at the data link layer of a WAN link. When the router at the manufacturing location receives a packet destined for corporate headquarters, it performs a route lookup and determines that the next hop is across the WAN. Once the router determines the next hop address, though, how does it encapsulate the packet for delivery over the WAN physical link? Just like LANs, each WAN connection type uses a Layer 2 protocol to transport IP packets across the physical link. One example of such a WAN Layer 2 protocol is PPP. PPP can transport IP traffic as well as other Layer 3 protocols. This section focuses on IP traffic. PPP is used over leased lines as well as dial-up, broadband, and cellular connections. The process for encapsulating the data into a PPP frame is the same as it is for an Ethernet frame. Once the router encapsulates the IP packet in the Layer 2 PPP frame, the Layer 3 IP address isn't examined again until the PPP frame arrives at the destination router. There, the router strips the PPP frame, performs a route lookup, determines the next hop address, and encapsulates the packet into a new data link frame for delivery. Remember that a packet can be encapsulated using different technologies at different points along the path to its destination. A packet that is sent over a WAN using PPP can then be re-encapsulated in an Ethernet frame for routing over a LAN. Both the router at the manufacturing facility and the router at headquarters must be configured to use PPP as the data link layer protocol in their communications with one another or the two routers won't understand each other. PPP was designed in the late 1980s to support communication between devices, such as routers, over lease lines. Back then, line quality was a major concern, so several mechanisms were built into PPP to help it handle and react to poor conditions. PPP is known as a connection-oriented protocol. Using PPP, Two devices establish a formal connection that ensures that they are ready to communicate. Ethernet, on the other hand, is a connectionless protocol. With Ethernet, when a device wants to send data to another device, it just sends it. It has no idea if the device is ready to receive it. In a PPP connection, the two devices can be end-user devices, routers, network access servers, or others. When the two devices want to communicate using PPP, they must first go through a formal connection establishment process using special PPP-specific protocols. This three-step process is sometimes called a handshake. First, using the Link Control Protocol, or LCP, devices establish a connection and configure the link. Next, if required, the device can verify the identity of the other device by going through an authentication process. Finally, devices use a second PPP-specific protocol the Network Control Protocol, or NCP, to configure the Layer 3 protocols in use on the link. Before devices can send data using PPP, both ends of the link must send and receive LCP packets to configure and test the link. Click the link on screen for more detailed information about PPP's LCP and how it establishes and negotiates a connection, or click Continue to move on to the second step.
During the second step, a device can verify the identity of the other device by going through an authentication process. This step is optional. PPP was designed to work over a variety of links, such as dedicated point-to-point -point links, dial-up connections, and digital subscriber line, or DSL connections. For dedicated point-to-point -point links, authentication is not typically needed. On dial-up or DSL connections, an Internet service provider might want to verify the identity of the user, also known as the caller, trying to establish a connection. If the devices agreed to perform authentication, a series of authentication messages are sent to verify the caller. If authentication fails, PPP shuts down or terminates the link. If authentication is successful, the devices move on to the next step, NCP. Click the link on screen to learn more about the PPP authentication process or click continue to move on to the third step of the handshake. Now that the first two steps are complete, we move on to the last step in the process, configuring the Layer 3 protocols in use on the link. Once the connection is established, PPP uses a Network Control Protocol, or NCP, specific to each Layer 3 protocol to establish and configure the different Layer 3 protocols running over the connection. Devices in an IP-based network use the IP Control Protocol, or IPCP, to configure, enable, and disable the IP protocol on both ends of the point-to-point -point link. As we just saw when establishing a connection, both sides of the WAN must agree on everything before the data can be transmitted on the link, including which IP addresses will be used. This process is very different than with LANs. WAN devices running PPP use IPCP to configure the IP addresses in use and optionally request the use of a compression protocol. For those of you who remember dial-up, in the few seconds it took for your PC to connect with your ISP or office network, the two devices were using PPP to determine your PC's IP address. In fact, many DSL services continue to use PPP today. For more details on IPCP, click the link shown on screen, or click the Continue button to move on. With IPCP, devices can either request a specific IP address or, as is the case here, request IP address 0.0.0.0. .0 this IPCP configure request really means that device A wants device B to do all the work and offer a specific IP address. Device B receives the IPCP configure request and responds with an IPCP configure NAC or negative acknowledgement because it can't assign an IP address of 0.0.0.0. .0 Notice that device B includes an alternate IP address in the NAC. Device A sends a new IPCP configure request, which now includes the IP address device B suggested. Device B responds with an IPCP configure ACK, indicating that both sides agree to the new address. Device A now knows what IP address it should use. But what about device B? Both sides of the connection go through the PPP IPCP configuration process so that each knows the other's IP address. Once the three step process is complete, the devices can send data across the link without having to add explicit addresses to the frame, unlike Ethernet, where addressing information is included in every frame. The connection is typically maintained by sending periodic messages called keep alives. When the devices are finished sending data, they can terminate or end the connection. Like Ethernet, PPP also defines a standard frame format. When the router needs to send data across the point to point line, it encapsulates it in the PPP frame shown on screen. Let's take a look at the fields in a PPP frame. Move your mouse over each field to learn more. As the Acme company grows and establishes remote sales offices, as well as added manufacturing locations, the network continues to grow. One approach is to lease additional dedicated point-to-point -point links, one for each remote location. This solution, however, can be expensive. The desire for a more cost-effective and scalable WAN technology 
led to the development of Frame Relay, which we'll look at next. PPP is an effective solution for businesses or organizations with multiple locations that need to communicate over a WAN. One drawback, though, is that PPP requires a dedicated circuit between each location. These circuits are called leased lines, and while they are owned by the service provider and not outright by the customer, no other devices can send information across that circuit. While leased lines provide guaranteed bandwidth between sites, they tend to be expensive, and companies pay for network capacity they might not fully use. In our example, every new Acme Company location requires an additional leased line and an additional router port at corporate headquarters. But what if you need to add five new locations or ten? At corporate headquarters, not only will you need five or ten new leased lines, which are extremely expensive, you might even need to get a new, larger router with additional router ports to handle those new locations. In the 1980s and the 1990s, new WAN technologies emerged as alternatives to dedicated leased lines for site-to-site -site communication. First, Frame Relay, another WAN technology that operates at the data link layer. With Frame Relay, customers still have a leased line, but only until they reach the service provider's network. The service provider can then establish multiple virtual connections running over a single leased line. A virtual connection is also known as a virtual circuit or logical circuit. When two sites need to communicate, the service provider configures a virtual circuit to get the data from one site to another. To the customer, a virtual circuit looks and acts just like a physical dedicated connection. Because multiple virtual circuits can run over a single physical connection, customers can communicate with multiple sites without installing additional leased lines. When a new connection is required, the provider simply provisions a new virtual circuit between the locations using the same physical connection. Because multiple customers connect to the same network, within the network, service providers share network resources among many customers, reducing everyone's costs. Since many customers use the same public network, Frame Relay is an example of a virtual private network, or VPN. A VPN is a private network built across a public network, such as the service provider's network or the Internet. In the case of Frame Relay, the service provider keeps customer traffic separated using virtual circuits. Frame Relay is a cost-efficient choice compared to PPP and leased lines, but it doesn't actually make the network any faster, and network congestion problems can easily arise in these shared lines. Variable frame lengths can aggravate congestion problems when larger frames queue up ahead of shorter, delay-sensitive frames, such as voice or video. A different network technology, Asynchronous Transfer Mode, or ATM, sought to address these issues and create much faster networks. ATM is a cell switching technology, which means that Layer 3 packets are segmented into fixed-length 53-byte cells. It differs from other Layer 2 packet switching protocols, such as PPP, Frame Relay, or Ethernet, which simply encapsulate packets in variable-length Layer 2 frames. The fixed length cell allows very fast switches to be built because the switches don't have to spend time determining the start and end of a variable length frame. The fixed cell size also ensures that delay sensitive data, such as voice or video, is not adversely affected by long data frames. In addition, ATM labels different types of data and enables the transport of voice, video, and data on the same network with guaranteed performance or quality of service for each type of traffic. Like Frame Relay, ATM allows many customers to share a service provider's network resources and create private VPNs. ATM is a very complicated technology, and ATM networks are very expensive to deploy, operate, and manage. Both Frame Relay and ATM require specialized network experts to run the network, and in performance, they are not the fastest WAN options by today's standards. For these reasons, they are not frequently used today. In the next section, We'll see how advances in Ethernet technology have allowed it to become a viable WAN technology with many benefits for today's networks. Over the last 10 years, the need for high-speed access to the Internet, as well as for site-to-site -site connectivity, has skyrocketed. With more and more video, voice, and other bandwidth-hogging applications being placed on the network, legacy WAN technologies such as Frame Relay and even ATM networks have not been able to keep up with the demand. Ethernet has stepped up to the challenge. We have discussed Ethernet as a LAN technology, but carrier Ethernet is now being used as a WAN technology as well. Ethernet interfaces as fast as 100 gigabits per second are available today 
and even faster Ethernet speeds are coming to market. An Ethernet solution in the WAN benefits both the service provider and the customer. Using Ethernet as the WAN solution, the customer no longer needs frame relay and ATM experts to run the network. Customers, such as the Acme company, no longer need specialized premise equipment to handle different Layer 2 technologies. And service providers can offer multiple services using a single interface to the customer. Before Ethernet WAN could be offered to customers, service providers needed to surmount a number of challenges. Usually when a customer purchases WAN service, service level agreements or SLAs are in place to ensure that the service provider provides good service to the customer. Common SLAs would cover frame delay and frame loss. Service providers needed to be able to provide and prove the same level of service with Ethernet that a customer could get from PPP, frame relay, or ATM. Allowing an Ethernet WAN to scale has always posed a challenge to the service provider. For instance, for an Ethernet switch to forward Ethernet frames, it must learn the MAC address of each of the end stations on the customer network. For a service provider serving thousands of customers, this need might mean that the service provider-owned switches must potentially learn millions of MAC addresses. Another issue with scalability is preventing loops. Redundant links between the service provider and its customers ensure that if a single link fails, data still has a path to get through. But these redundant links also create loops. The spanning tree protocols used in local area networks could not scale to prevent the loops possible in thousands of customer sites. Ethernet was also lacking operation, administration, and maintenance, or OAM features. For example, in the case of ATM, OAM features would allow administrators to verify the status of ATM permanent virtual circuits. This same capability was necessary to monitor Ethernet links. Several organizations have been working to solve the problems that Ethernet poses in the WAN and have made great progress. The three primary organizations that are helping enable Ethernet WAN services are the Metro Ethernet Forum, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and the International Telecommunication Union. The Metro Ethernet Forum is the defining body of Carrier Ethernet and includes a global alliance of over 150 organizations, including service providers, cable operators, network equipment manufacturers, software manufacturers, and others. The goal of the forum is to accelerate the worldwide adoption of Carrier Ethernet networks and services. It has released a number of technical specifications. Click the link on screen to view all specifications available on the Metro Ethernet Foundation website or click continue to move on. As you know from earlier in this course, the IEEE's 802 category covers Ethernet standards. New additions pertinent to carrier Ethernet include provider bridging, provider backbone bridging, connectivity fault management, and many more. The ITUT is the ITU's telecommunications standardization sector and provides a series of recommendations for carrier Ethernet including the G-Series of recommendations for transmission systems and media, digital systems, and networks, as well as the Y-Series of global information infrastructure, IP aspects, and next-generation networks. The Metro Ethernet Forum has defined a three-layer model for carrier Ethernet networks, which is somewhat like a collapsed version of the five-layer network model we've been referring to in this course. This three-layer model reflects an increasingly blurry line between the functions of the different layers. As functionality is more tightly integrated, it becomes more difficult and less useful to pick the layers apart. In the MEF three-layer model, the Application Services layer supports end-user applications. The Ethernet Services layer carries the applications. This layer is the main focus of the Metro Ethernet Forum. Carrier Ethernet resides on the Ethernet Services layer. The Transport Services layer uses various networking and media types to deliver the Ethernet services. This layer includes technologies like Provider Backbone Bridging, Virtual Private LAN Service, or VPLS, Sonnet, SDH, and OTN. This three-layer model also has three different planes. Each layer has its own data, control, and management planes. The data plane handles data according to the rules or logic in place. The control plane instructs the data plane on how to process data. In other words, that's the source of the rules or logic. The management plane provides the administrative interface allowing for configuration. While the MEF three-layer model can be helpful when discussing carrier Ethernet, in our next section, we'll return to our five-layer model to learn about MPLS, a WAN service that allows companies to bring PPP, frame relay, ATM, and Ethernet 
into the same network. Today, the Acme Company is a multinational organization and wants to be able to communicate securely with any location at any time. And all of the video conferencing they've been doing lately is starting to tax their Frame Relay VPN. As we just saw, Carrier Ethernet is the fastest WAN option today, but Carrier Ethernet does not, in itself, provide the possibility of creating a VPN. Frame Relay and ATM rely on virtual connections, so creating virtual private networks is an integral part of their functionality. Not so with native Ethernet, but this functionality can be enabled by using multi-protocol label switching, or MPLS. In fact, MPLS can be used with any Layer 2 protocol, including Ethernet, PPP, Frame Relay, or ATM. MPLS provides the privacy and security of a Frame Relay or ATM network, yet allows for the inherent any-to-any -any connectivity and flexibility typical of an IP-based network. With MPLS, Acme Company can have a single physical connection to its WAN service provider, send IP packets, and get VPN services, regardless of the provider's Layer 2 protocol. And, best of all, it can have all this with minimal investment and effort, leaving the provider to establish and manage the interconnections or mesh. Many customers are transitioning their old frame relay or ATM-based VPNs to MPLS VPNs, and often, they're using Ethernet as their Layer 2 protocol of choice to do it. So how does MPLS work? Let's start with the basics. First, unlike PPP or Ethernet, which are Layer 2 protocols, MPLS isn't a Layer 2 protocol or even a Layer 3 protocol. Instead, MPLS sits between Layer 2 and Layer 3 and is often referred to as a Layer 2.5 protocol. Like Frame Relay, MPLS is an encapsulation and packet switching technique used to route data over a WAN. But MPLS can be used over any Layer 2 technology, including PPP or Ethernet, making it far more flexible. Taking a look at part of Acme Company's current network, you can see that the company is now using MPLS to interconnect the three locations shown on screen. Notice that some of the connections between Acme's router and the provider's network are running different Layer 2 protocols. For example, the router at corporate headquarters is using Ethernet as its Layer 2 protocol, and Site 1 is using PPP as its Layer 2 protocol. When Acme built its Layer 2 VPN using Frame Relay, it used virtual circuits to connect each location. MPLS takes a slightly different approach. Instead of using virtual circuits, MPLS uses label-switched paths to connect each location. Notice that in this network, these paths start and end on the provider's routers, not the customer's routers. Acme simply needs one physical connection using any type of Layer 2 protocol to connect to its provider's network. No logical or virtual connections are needed, as is the case with Frame Relay. Just like the other technologies, MPLS has its own set of terminology. A label-switched path is known as an LSP. An LSP is similar to a Frame Relay virtual circuit, except that it is not dependent on a particular Layer 2 technology. One big difference, however, is that an LSP is unidirectional, so customers need a matching LSP in the opposite direction. Typically, both LSPs follow the same path in the network, as we show here. However, it's not a requirement, and LSPs can take other paths. For simplicity, we're only going to show one LSP for each location. Now let's review a few more MPLS terms. Routers running the MPLS protocol are known as Label Switching Routers, or LSRs. Here, the provider has many LSRs within its MPLS network, which is also known as an MPLS domain. The MPLS domain also has three ingress LSRs, which are also known as Label Edge Routers, or LERs. A label edge router is a special type of LSR that is responsible for assigning the appropriate MPLS label to a packet. When the customer's data arrives at the provider's MPLS domain, the ingress LER strips the Layer 2 frame and looks at the IP header. The incoming frame can be encapsulated as Ethernet, PPP, or another format. Regardless of the frame's Layer 2 format, the LER strips off the Layer 2 frame to inspect the packet. It then adds an MPLS header. So how does the LER know which label to assign and ultimately which path or LSP the packets take? 
LERs can look at any number of fields in the IP header when doing MPLS label and LSP assignment. For instance, the LER can assign labels based on the destination IP network, a combination of the destination network and application type, source and destination networks, or a specific QoS requirement. In our example, the LER is simply looking at the destination IP network to assign a label. Each label also translates to an MPLS Forwarding Equivalency Class, or FEC. A FEC is a group of packets that will be treated or forwarded the same way within the provider's MPLS domain. Packets belonging to the same FEC get assigned the same MPLS label and follow the same LSP. So in this network, packets going from Site 1 to Headquarters follow the blue LSP, and packets going from Site 1 to Site 2 follow the yellow LSP. The label in the packet identifies the FEC, as well as the LSP to be used. Here we see that an LER has received data from ACME Site 1. The LER strips the Layer 2 frame and inspects the IP header to determine which label to assign. After adding or pushing an MPLS label on a packet, the LER encapsulates the label packet in the appropriate Layer 2 frame and forwards the label packet along the associated LSP. Each LSR in the path makes a forwarding decision based solely on the contents of the label. The LSR strips off the Layer 2 frame, performs a lookup using the MPLS label, removes or pops the old label, and puts on or pushes a new one, telling the next hop how to forward the labeled packet. The LSR then encapsulates the labeled packet in a new Layer 2 frame and forwards it on the LSP. The next router repeats the same process. It removes the old label and adds a new one based solely on the ports and labels in its switching table. Notice that neither this router nor the previous one examined the data's IP header. Because these routers only look at the MPLS labels, they are referred to as transit LSRs. This router now encapsulates the labeled packet in a new Layer 2 frame and forwards it on the LSP. When the labeled packet reaches the end of the LSP, an egress LER removes the Layer 2 frame and the MPLS label. Next, it examines the destination IP address to determine the next hop. It encapsulates the packet in the appropriate Layer 2 frame and sends it out the appropriate interface. Notice that the IP packet originally entered the MPLS network using PPP and exited the MPLS cloud using Ethernet. MPLS works independently of the Layer 2 technology. MPLS label-based switching methods allow routers to make forwarding decisions based on the contents of a simple label, rather than by performing a complex route lookup based on destination IP address. Click the link on screen for a more detailed discussion on how MPLS label switching differs from traditional IP routing, or click the Continue button to continue with this topic. Let's compare IP routing and MPLS switching in a bit more detail, starting with IP routing. The diagram shows four routers between the communicating devices. The first router receives the packet from the source, examines the IP header, and locates the destination IP address. The router then looks in its routing table and performs a longest match route lookup. Once it finds a match, it forwards the IP packet to the next hop router. Notice that the router did not examine any other fields in the IP header, such as the source address or application port numbers. So all packets going to this particular destination network receive the same treatment. The next router in the path receives the same IP packet, finds the destination IP address, and performs a longest match route lookup. Keep in mind that a longest match route lookup is, in the realm of routing, a fairly labor-intensive effort. A router could have hundreds of thousands of networks in its routing table. In traditional IP routing, a longest match route lookup is performed at each step along the way. Once again, this router sends the IP packet to the next hop router, where the process is repeated until the IP packet reaches the final destination. Remember that each router performed a route lookup using only the destination IP address. Let's compare that scenario with what happens to a packet in an MPLS domain. There are still four routers, but instead of having IP routing between them, the leftmost router is the ingress LSR, and at the end of the LSP is the egress LSR. 
The first router receives the packet from the source, examines the IP header, possibly looking at fields other than the destination IP address, and assigns it to a forwarding equivalency class. Next, the LSR adds an MPLS header with the appropriate label and forwards it to the next device in the LSP. The second router receives the MPLS packet, performs a simple label lookup and label swap before sending it to the next router where the process is repeated. Notice that these two transit LSRs did not even look at the destination IP address in the IP header. When the packet reaches the egress LSR, the MPLS header is removed and the IP packet is sent to the correct destination. The MPLS routing process allows routing based on more than just a destination IP address. In addition, once the data is traversing transit LSRs, the MPLS label lookup and swap is a simple and fast process compared to performing a longest match route lookup. We mentioned earlier that some people refer to MPLS as a Layer 2.5 technology. Here you see the MPLS header, which is sometimes referred to as a SHIM header because it's located between the Layer 2 and Layer 3 headers. Because the label is inserted between the Layer 2 and Layer 3 header, a single LSP can traverse frame relay, PPP, and Ethernet networks. Move your mouse over any field to learn more about it. Click Continue when you are ready to move on. The MPLS standards define many different types of services, such as MPLS Layer 2 and Layer 3 VPNs, Virtual Private LAN Services or VPLS, Generalized MPLS, MPLS Traffic Engineering, and Network Management. Layer 3 MPLS VPNs, which are also known as IP VPNs, are becoming increasingly popular among service providers, so let's take a quick look at them in detail. A deeper discussion of other MPLS services is beyond the scope of this course. In this network, customer A and customer B require connectivity between their three locations. The service provider needs to provide connectivity between the different locations on the shared IP network. With MPLS, the provider uses LSPs to provide that connectivity. Here you can see that each VPN is represented by a different color LSP. Notice that the mesh of LSPs starts at the provider's routers, not the customer routers, which is very different from Frame Relay. Like MPLS, Layer 3 MPLS VPNs also introduce a new set of terminology. First, the Customer Edge Router, or CE Router, within an individual site uses a single physical connection to connect to a Provider Edge Router, or PE Router, using any Layer 2 protocol. The Customer Edge Router does not even run MPLS. In fact, the Customer Edge Router doesn't even know it is connecting to an MPLS Layer 3 VPN. With Layer 3 MPLS VPNs, the Provider Edge Routers do all the work. Provider Edge Routers are a type of label edge router and must provide completely private and secure connectivity within a VPN. At a high level, the Provider Edge Router accomplishes this task by building an LSP between other Provider Edge Routers for each customer location. But Provider Edge Routers do more than assign labels. The Provider Edge Routers also exchange routing information with Customer Edge Routers. The Provider Edge Router stores the customer's routing information in a Virtual Routing and Forwarding Table, or instance, which is known as a VRF. VRFs are specific to a customer or VPN and are not shared. To help explain MPLS Layer 3 VPNs, we've simplified the network a bit. In this example, each Provider Edge Router has a connection to Customer A and Customer B. The Provider Edge and Customer Edge Routers exchange routing information. The routes are stored in the Customer's VRF on the Provider Edge Router. Notice that each customer has a separate and unique VRF. The Provider Edge Routers also establish LSPs between each customer's VRF. 
These LSPs are used to keep customer traffic separated. When the Provider Edge Router receives a packet from the Customer Edge Router, it performs a route lookup in the customer's VRF, determines which LSP should be used to reach the destination network, labels the packet, and sends it on the appropriate LSP. In this example, you'll also notice that there are several provider or P routers that do not connect to customer devices and only perform label switching. They don't directly participate in the VPN. The P routers, which are transit LSRs, only perform a label lookup and label swap and are not even aware of the VPN. When the label packet arrives at the egress provider edge router, it strips off the label, encapsulates the packet in a layer two frame appropriate to that network, and sends the packet out the appropriate interface. This section briefly covered basic MPLS terminology and concepts. It also provided a brief overview of MPLS Layer 3 VPNs, which more and more customers are starting to implement in lieu of frame relay or ATM-based VPNs. And often, they're using Carrier Ethernet as their Layer 2 protocol of choice to enable the fastest WAN speeds possible today. In our next section, we'll discuss different Layer 4 protocols. Here's a chance to test your knowledge. Drag each technology to the matching characteristic in the table. Incorrect answers will bounce back. Well done. You have matched all of the items correctly. Click Next when you are ready to move on. Can you distinguish fact from fiction? You will be presented with three sets of statements. In each group, two statements are true and one is false. Identify the two true statements in each group and click Check Answer. So far in this course, 